We are. Most of you are. So, uh, we thought maybe Fran wanted to do this last year, but because it was, the jam was actually on on his birthday. But uh, he asked me it's like January. You know, we, were, we were kind of booked, so. Uh, just lucky that we were all booked up in jam. Um, so, seriously, how about that first round? Wow. So this is the Lincoln Project. Uh, I'll let Fran explain, you know, how long it took him to put it together and, and how it was written and all that stuff. But uh, the numbers are very large, anyway. You know. And uh, some of you, if you've heard Trio Mio uh, play in, in live, uh, you've probably heard at least one of these songs. Um, if you haven't heard Trio Mio yet, you'll have a chance on March 3rd. Falls Cafe uh, will be opening for the Kirk Henry Band. Uh, anybody know what time that gig starts? It's a Saturday. Eight, eight o'clock. So trio meal from eight to something, and then Kirk from whatever to after that. And then because uh, time is continuous. You know, and uh, let's see. Uh, what's next? That's, that's all we got coming up here. Trio Mio is, is Fran and, and, and Bruce and the Terry and, and Robert Molly back there. The CD release party in uh, 2016 or so. Well, yeah, we record it right now. And, you know, I've got that written down. Next Saturday's coming down. Next Saturday's Breakaway at the High Falls Cafe. Breakaway? Why didn't I hear about this? And with Jeff in, and yeah, oh my goodness, well, and Robin Baker. So once again, uh, High Falls Cafe, Amara, Robin, and Terry, and, and, and uh, Bill Benton's uh, annual uh, Valentine's Day bash. Uh, and if you don't want to go that far, Cafe Mezzaluna uh, has Aaron Hobson from 11 to 2. And uh, that's just crazy. So make sure you get to see somebody in the RC. Come out and see live music. All right, um, so I, I will briefly introduce the players, but then uh, I'm going to turn this over to Frank. So uh, uh, we have, uh, as our, our narrator tonight, is Bruce Blair. And, uh, uh, playing uh, guitar and mandolin is Bruce Hildenbrand. And, uh, keyboard and vocals is Lauren Tully. Sorry, Kiriaki, but you know, somebody spilled a drink on your keyboard and it, and it, uh, it shrunk. So, uh, and uh, on guitar and vocals is Jeff Enton. And back here, we're going to have Kimberly. Reappearance from the first round, T.G. Benini. <laughs> he appears like Brigadoon. Yeah. 20 minutes. Okay, so, and of course the composer and the star of the show and everything else is Fran Hummer. Yeah. Uh, this project started about four years ago, for almost five actually, when I was looking for something to write songs about. I read uh, Carl Sandburg's The Prairie Years and The War Years and a collection of Abraham Lincoln's own writings and speeches enough so that uh, certain things have stuck in my memory. And uh, the facets of Lincoln, of his character, his wit, and his personality made me say, this is exceptional, this is no ordinary person. Here are some examples of those. Lincoln once said, I wish to be right in all things. The man who can show me I'm wrong is my friend. Can you picture a contemporary public figure making it? <laughs> Once a colleague pressed him to use his personal and professional influence against a political foe, stating that he should overcome any qualms and destroy his enemies. 
Lincoln answered, but do I not destroy my enemy when I make him my friend? Okay, another reason. A longtime friend of Lincoln stated he could make a cat laugh. Here are three examples of his wit. In answer to a letter from a bank inquiring about the financial standing of a friend, Lincoln wrote, First, he has a wife and a baby. Together, they ought to be worth $500,000 to any man. <laughs> Secondly, he has an office in which there is a table worth $1.50 and three chairs worth, say, a dollar. Last of all, there is in one corner a large rat hole, which we'll look bear, bear looking into. <laughs> That's Lincoln, yeah. Traveling the circuit from town to town with his brother lawyers was a three-month-long event each spring and fall for Lincoln, and being an all-male affair took on at times a boys-will-be-boys -boys atmosphere. Once, when a portly fellow lawyer split the seat of his pants beyond repair, a paper was circulated among the lawyers asking for contributions to buy their fellow lawyer a new pair of pants. When the petition came to Lincoln, he wrote next to his name, I regret that I cannot contribute to the end in view. <laughs> and lastly, a rainy cold night saw Lincoln the last of the lawyers to reach that night's lodgings. The others had gathered close to the pot-bellied stove, intentionally taking up all the chairs, leaving no space for Lincoln to warm himself when he arrived. When Lincoln entered, one of these wags announced, Lincoln, you look like you've been through hell. I have, said Lincoln. Well, what's it like, the lawyer asked. Same as here, said Lincoln. Lawyers closest to the fire. <laughs> uh, tonight's program of songs and spoken word will take us from Lincoln's birth in 1809 through his youth and early adult years. The characters are Abe Lincoln, his mother Nancy Hanks Lincoln, his father Tom Lincoln, and his stepmother Sarah Bush Lincoln. And uh, I'd like to thank all the performers here uh, in advance for helping help me out with this. It's been a real pleasure working with them. And finally, I'll finish with a quote from Lincoln to describe this evening's program. For those who like this sort of thing, this is exactly the sort of thing they will like. Madison was the fourth president of these new United States, whose population was estimated at 7,239,881. Few noted that on this February day, a son was born to Thomas Lincoln, 28 years old, and Nancy Hanks Lincoln, 23 years old. The child, named after his grandfather Abraham, increased the new nation's population by one. The boy was the second child, his older sister Sarah having been born two years earlier. The family lived in Hardin County, Kentucky, in a log cabin built by Tom Lincoln from timber cut nearby. Kentucky was then the frontier, which meant that life was made up of fighting the natives for the land, and at the same time attempting to claim the land from the forest and the animals living within it. Then, the unending work of subsistence farming would begin. Manual labor from sun up to sundown was the order of each day. You ate what you took hunting and what you raised on your land. Along with the dangers of the frontier, Americans, America settlers faced the usual litany of threats that came with poverty, poor nutrition, poor shelter and clothing, illness and accident, and an almost total lack of medical care. 
Two of every ten children did not survive the first year of life. Adult life expectancy was less than 40 years. A frontier family relied on folk medicine and herbs, a close watch by the mother, and a resigned hope and religion, the last refuge of the helpless. A mother rocking her new baby to sleep might sing him a lullaby, promising him her caring protection from harm, and invoking God's watch as he sleeps. survived and seemed to thrive on the hardships of the frontier. As he grew taller and stronger, Abe began handling his share of the chores farm life demanded. Fetching water and wood, planting seeds and pulling weeds, picking nuts, berries, and other wild fruit, learning to handle the plow and horse. These exertions all seemed not to wear him down, but to build him up. At the age of seven, he was handed an axe and learned the uses of that most essential tool to clear brush and trees, to cut and shape lumber for building and for fuel and for fences. Also at around the age of seven, Abe began his schooling. He went to the Knob Creek School to learn the rudiments of reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
It was a blab school. All the children recited their lessons out loud and all at once. Class? Johnny, you forgot Jericho, 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 Mary, and three and three is six. And the walls came Johnny, down. Johnny, H, I, and the walls came down. Hey, that's not funny. Sarah, very good, Sarah. <laughs> However, book learning was not a priority of Tom Lincoln. Hadn't he gotten along fine without reading? Why, until his wife had shown him how, he hadn't even been able to spell his name. And hadn't he gotten along fine? What good was math when all he needed was to make a charcoal mark on the ceiling beams when he needed to remember how many bushels of corn he'd sold to his neighbors? He didn't care for what he saw as time wasted on such foolishness as books when farm work needed doing. He saw Abe's strange silences, distracted moments, and solemnity as laziness. And when he caught him reading instead of doing chores, his criticism was loud and occasionally physical. He didn't understand the boy, and Abe's closeness to his mother, who supported him in his wish to learn, irritated him. It was the beginning of an estrangement between father and son that was to last throughout both their lives. Work to do when work is done From daybreak to the setting sun Axe and plow and all the night It's all you need to build your life Stand up straight, stand up straight Get to work and don't be late Just stand up straight, just stand up straight Keep things straight, keep things level Tell the truth and shame the devil Cure for the blues is go to work Remember God hates those who shirk Go stand up straight, stand up straight Get to work and don't be late Just stand up straight, go oh, stand up straight Don't you slouch, don't you dawdle I won't cut slack and I won't coddle Spare the rod, the child will spoil Man don't live, a man don't toil Stand up straight, stand up straight Get to work and don't be late Just stand up straight, oh stand up straight Don't need books, don't need schooling Don't need no educated fooling Learn and don't make a lifted lighter Bad bargains one that you hope tighter Stand up straight, stand up straight Get to work and don't be late Just stand up straight, oh stand up straight grew and the world changed. Far off in Europe, events were taking place which would spread their influence all the way to Lincoln's Knob Creek Farm. Napoleon's 15-year dominance of Europe ended in 1815 at Waterloo. He died six years later, both the ruler and prisoner of the 47 square miles of the island of St. Helena. Among his many accomplishments, he was, as Carl Sandburg said, the first man to be Napoleonic. <laughs> Napoleon had also been responsible in 1803 for the sale of nearly 500 million acres of French claimed North American land to the United States. Tens of thousands of pioneers began the trek west to claim some of it. Tom Lincoln joined them in 1816, hearing of better land along the Big Blue River in Indiana, Pigeon Creek, Indiana to be exact. The Lincolns traveled the 50 miles to their new home in the fall, then wintered there in a three-sided pole shed warmed by a fire burning at the open sign. In the spring, Tom and Abe cut the timber for the 18 by 18 windowless cabin that they would live in, the wooden furniture it would hold, and even its chimney made of sticks and clay. The next, several, the next year, several of Nancy Lincoln's relatives moved near Within a year, two had died, taken by the milk sick, so-called because it began with a whitish coating on the sick person's tongue. Soon after, Nancy Hanks Lincoln sickened, <coughs> suffering with fever and abdominal cramps. 
She lingered a short while, then died on October 5th, 1818, 36 years of age. Again, Tom and Abe had work to do. Tom sawed the coffin planks. Abe whittled the pegs used to hold the planks together. And Nancy Hanks Lincoln was buried in a nearby clearing. Another year passed. And Tom Lincoln left Abe and Sarah to care for the cabin while he traveled back to Kentucky. There he went to the home of a recently widowed woman he had known prior to his marriage and knocked on the door. When she answered, he said, Miss Johnston, I have no wife and you no husband. I came to marry you if you're willing. She replied, I have debts. Tom paid them and they were married on December 2nd, 1819. Returning to Pigeon Creek, Tom Lincoln said to the children, here's your new mammy. was almost 11 years old, his body began to stretch out, as most boys will. By the time he was 17, he had stretched to nearly 6 feet 4 inches tall. Ten years of daily farm work had made him strong, stronger than nearly all the other men in his neck of the woods. He could hold an axe at the handle's end between his thumb and first two fingers, straight out from his shoulder without it quivering. Once, a farmer wanted a small shed moved across the yard, while four men went, who were going to move it looked around for poles to get into the shed to raise it. Abe got his shoulders under a corner of it and carried the shed to where the farmer wanted it. He was the best wrestler in the neighborhood. He could outrun, outjump, and outthrow all who came up against him. And his strength was more than physical. He had learned by reading, borrowing books wherever he could find them. He'd stretch out in front of the fireplace reading till past midnight, when everyone else had long been asleep. When people asked why, he said, the things I want to know are in books. My best friend is the man who'll get me a book I ain't read. Often, he would talk to the other boys about what he had read. 
He said that saying the thoughts out loud helped him to remember and understand them better. The other boys thought this attempt to educate himself peculiar some. Yet, as time went on, they came to him to write their letters or to read from the infrequent newspaper, which happened to make it out to Pigeon Creek. So, it, it must have come to Abe one day that all of his physical and mental strengths, which made him so peculiar some, also made him more capable than the people he lived among. All the hardship, all the work, all the disappointments, all the death he'd seen was of a piece with the experiences of his neighbors, but his response to these trials was not like their resignation or their retreat into religion or drink. As he could physically out-wrestle any opponent, he found he could grab hold of an idea and not let go till he had made it give up its meaning. Perhaps this meant he could use his capabilities to rise up from Pigeon Creek and move out into the world, which he'd first heard about in the books he had read. In four years, he would be 21 and his own man, no longer beholden to his father. Then time would tell. But for now, he could enjoy the fact he was a young man in his prime, the big buck of this lick. Don't care if I do that. 
years 1830 through 1835 were once again years of movement and party, the life and death of the Lincolns. Tom Lincoln and the family pulled up stakes and moved to Illinois. Just after the move, Abe turned 21 and struck out on his own. He and his cousin Dennis built a flatboat for a speculator, and then floated it down and its cargo down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Upon his return, he said goodbye to his family and moved himself to New Salem, Illinois. Shortly after his arrival, his courage and strength were tested by the locals. He outwrestled Jack Armstrong, the champion tough of the Clary Grove Boys. His good-natured attitude and wit helped the local boys to accept the defeat and to accept him as one of their own. His intelligence earned him a place with the local lawyers and businessmen who were the community's official leaders. Both these connections gave him a start in his struggles to support himself in his new home. He was hired to work in the local general store. He was given the political patronage job of postmaster, which gave him the opportunity to read the newspapers delivered to New Salem, and thereby gain a greater sense of the outside world. After reading the necessary books, he was appointed town surveyor. He surveyed much of the north end of Sangamon County, learning the land and the people on it. The people liked him. They saw he was different with his reading and his sharpness of mind and his physical strength, but he was like them too. He dressed like them, ate their food, worked like them and didn't put on airs about any of them. So when it came time to send a militia troop to the Black Hawk War, his neighbors elected Abraham Lincoln captain of volunteers. After returning from his military service, Sangamon community leaders asked Abe to run for the state legislature. His campaign speech was typical Lincoln, stating, my politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, it will be all the same. He lost that election statewide, but as a sign of his standing with his neighbors, he captured 277 votes out of the 300 cast in New Salem. This experience gave him a leg up when in 1833 he ran again for the state legislature, and this time was elected. So within three years of coming to New Salem, it was seen that he had been marked out as someone special and put forward by the locals as someone they would promote and follow. There was also rumor to be another person he had made a favorable impression on, Ann Rutledge, the red-haired daughter of the local sawmill owner. The locals thought that the new legislator and the younger girl had an understanding. Her brother thought them nigh unengaged. But again, death came to the frontier, and on August 25th, 1835, Ann Rutledge died of typhoid fever.
forget, stories went around New Salem about Abe's wandering alone and distraught to Anne's gravesite. His friends Nancy and Bowling Green took him into their home and attempted to ease him out of his grief with kindness and the daily chores of frontier life. Still, he spent hours distracted, seeing no one, trapped deep inside himself, wrestling once again, but this time with questions of life and death. First his aunt and uncle, then his mother, his sister, and now Anne, had died before their time. What reason or purpose could there be in this sudden cutting short of the lives of those he loved? Over time and gradually, he seemed to quiet his sorrow. Folks could again see the semblance of the intelligent, joking young man he had been, but the melancholy was not banished, merely subdued. It remained an integral part of his personality for the rest of his life. The outward signs were apparent only intermittently, but the interior mark was indelible. During this time, he committed to memory a poem by the Scottish poet William Knox called Mortality. <coughs> The choice is a window into Abe's thoughts. Oh, why should the spirit of a mortal be proud? Like a swift flying meteor, a fast flying cloud. A flash of the lightning, a break of the way. He passes from life to his rest in the grave. The maid on whose cheek, on whose brow, in whose eye, show beauty and pleasure, her pleasures are by. And the memory of those who loved her and praised Are alike from the minds of the living similar to his neighbors in the life they all led, the work they had to do, the hardships they had to endure. Would his life too follow their common path of grinding poverty, threatened and shortened by the diseases and the accidents of the American frontier? It was a possibility. But we have also seen his capabilities, his size and strength, his physical prowess in games and work, his intellect and wit, and perhaps most telling, his hunger for success. Success was also a possibility. 
No one could tell where this young man's life would take him. He had survived losses of those dearest to him, losses which had scarred but not broken him. He had endured an emotional estrangement from his father, helped by a stepmother who understood his silences and his worth. Sorrow and loss had, loss had been visited on him and would follow him as they follow us all. He had found he could survive and continue with his life. There were other possibilities to strive for, other places outside of Sangamon County. The world was turning round and opening up before him. What would he do in it? What would he become? In the sky, red fox on the ground. Rabbit skips away in a single bound. The world is turning round, turning round, round, round. Finales like Howard Lincoln and stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, but we're just going to do something goofy. And uh, so, uh, thank you all for coming out. And the next, the next Joshua Jam is in March. Uh, the I don't know, something. Ten. Ten. Thank you. And uh, but there is a fifth Saturday in March. So on the thirty-first, we got another one. Uh, the famous Long Liver Jam. Failed in October because it snows so much, and it's, you know you can't possibly snow at the end of March. So <laughs> this one's a go. So uh, so Fran's gonna lead us in, in all in song, and, and I hope everybody just carries on and sings with us. It's that first round, I think I've seen them all too. I've got a never-ending love for you. From now on, that's all I want to do. From the first time we met, I knew. I had a never-ending love for you. I've got a never-ending love for you. From now on, that's all I want to do. From the first time we met, 
The little project that you heard here tonight is back there for sale. You can make a donation uh, to the John Street Jam, uh, and or you can uh, buy somebody else's CD.